I've got a quote from Ed Abbey. As I typed these words several years after, this is on Arches, after the little episode of the Grey Jeep and the Thirsty Engineers, all that was foretold has come to pass. You will now find serpentine streams of Baroque automobiles pouring in and out in numbers that would have seemed fantastic when I worked there, from 3,000 to 30,000 to 300,000 per year. The visitation, as they call it, mounts ever upwards. So we kind of talked about this already a little bit, but the question is about accessibility versus wilderness. We've got increasing numbers of e-bikes, roads, campers in the most remote places, and, and you know, you'll see the flat screen TVs and putting greens on the roof of the camper, and it seems like to me that the pendulum has swung very far towards accessibility for everyone as sort of a reflection of the cultural zeitgeist right now, uh, as opposed to, you know, and how do we balance the wilderness and accessibility so that everyone gets a shot so that they can experience nature because we need stakeholders, right? Right. With also preserving what is, you know, so great about being there. Right. That's it. Well, I mean, that's the question of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you're asking the, the essential question of the day. And um, my answer to that is thank God for the 1964 Wilderness Act which settled some of these questions before they became caught on fire. Mm -hmm. um, and thank God for the, the concept of the national parks from 1872, which was incredibly, not just controversial, people hated it. Um, you know, uh, that was the Yellowstone National Park was established in 1872. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, I'm going to pontificate for a little bit. Oh, one of the things that happened there, if you notice, the 1964 Wilderness Act was written by Howard Zonheiser, who is not a hunter. But it was, it was David Brower of the Sierra Club, um, who, who was not a hunter either, but he, he knew about hunting. And, and um, these are people who, uh, they're reacting to the mutually assured destruction, nuclear apocalypse of, of the Cold War. Um, really and truly, the 64 Wilderness Act had been, in play, had been being worked on for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And people were looking, they were, they were questioning human beings' capacity for making the right decisions on landscapes and, and everything else. And how could you not? Like we were talking about absolute destruction of the planet with nuclear warfare. And so, and if you look at the, the foundation of, of Yellowstone National Park, which um, George Black has written a great book about that, Empire of Shadows, I think it's called. And... It's really controversial, and, and, and one of the guys who was one of the most instrumental in it was um, Doan. He lived right out here. Um, he was an instrumental in the Marais Massacre of the Blackfeet on the, on the Marais River north of here. Mm -hmm. And it got the wrong, they, 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 they massacred the wrong band of Blackfeet. It was, a, it was not just, it, it was emblematic disaster and, and slaughter. Um, it was so ugly that it, it's one of the uglier stories of the Indian conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a big advocate for Yellowstone National Park. He he believed that the better angels of our nature mm -hmm. could could provide a haven for the last of the big game and 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 preserve this land and all. There were many people who were involved in that. Um, I think Ulysses S. Grant would have been the president. We were coming out of slaughtering six hundred and twenty thousand combatants in a question over over uh, slavery and not just states' rights. It was mostly it was mostly the creation of a feudalist society in the South versus an egalitarian society of the United States that Jefferson and them had believed in. We we just slaughtered each other. We burned down an entire like section of our country over this. And what how many years later? Five six, seven years later we create the world's first national park. Mm -hmm. Those things are not unrelated. So the better angels of our nature, as, as Abraham Lincoln called it, were calling us to recognize the value of nature at a time when we were most incredibly destructive. And so that has carried on to now. Okay, So we have the national parks in place, and they are overwhelmed at times. We have the wilderness areas in place, and people still hate them. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right around here. Yeah. And what they want instead, I don't know. But we settled these questions, and we will settle this one as well. Not without conflict. Is it a question which, which ends? Is it just an interminable no, conflict? No, but it does end when 
the United States reaches a maximum population and perhaps begins to slowly decline in population, or when another culture is, takes over and decides that these things are not worth preserving. Mm -hmm. um, and industrial recreation, recreation, like you see around Moab, mm -hmm. it does make people think that maybe this is not, the public land stuff is not going to work out. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, these are, my, in my opinion, these are small areas of conflict. And over most of, say, the Lewis and Clark National Forest, where I spend most of my time, we don't have that conflict. Yeah. So we do not want to judge the efficacy or the, the durability of the entire model by these micro areas, however large they may be, that are overwhelmed with people. Yeah, it, se I, it seems like for a long time the model was uh, people you know, people would tourist or visit certain sites and there was enough sites that right. uh, the population didn't overwhelm them. And these days, I hear a lot of, where I'm at, I never, I've, I've never seen another hound hunter while I've been hunting. I've never seen, you know, I don't see people, but I think my perception is based on what I'm hearing that there's a lot more recreators of various sorts out because of COVID. And it may be that the population is now overrun you know, Yellowstone and Big Bend and the Grand Canyon, yep. and the, it's who are we to you know claim these spaces as hunters? But also, how do we how do we retain them? It's going to be hard. Um, it was hard to get the Wilderness Act passed. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be very difficult in the future because the space you need for for hunting, especially like hound hunting. Um, and again, you see California is emblematic, like, yeah. like people have just, just acted against it. Um, there's a huge fight going on, and I don't know enough about it, over in like England and Scotland now, yeah. about hunting, and about the preservation of the, the giant hunting estates. Yeah. Um, my friend Tony Bynum was over there filming, they're working on a film on that. Mm -hmm. um, but there, it's going to be extremely difficult. So here's one of the things that I keep coming back to, is... <clears throat> I believe that we are in a time of what's called human eruption, I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N. Mm -hmm. It's when a species explodes out of its carrying capacity for its, its uh, ecological niche. And people are so adaptable, we're like Norway rats. We, can, we, we really do well in a lot of different climates. We change things to fit ourselves up to a point until you run out of water. You know. But uh, that eruption doesn't last forever. And... I believe that if we can act with diplomacy, aggression, um, intelligence, compassion, all of these things necessary, that we can navigate this time, and the eruption will end, and I don't think it ends in nuclear bombs and shit like that, it just birth rates decline, mm -hmm. and, and we will have a, a group of people, I, I like to think about it, Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road, mm -hmm. Where the little boy keeps asking, "Are you carrying the fire?" Because that's what his dad always says. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like the we're not we're like some we're the good people. They're not the cannibals, right? Mm -hmm. They're not the guys running up and down the roads murdering everybody. We're carrying the fire, mm -hmm. and I believe that that hunters who are deeply engaged in landscape and and conservation and in their meditation in on this thing we're talking about, I believe that those people can teach their children and or other children. And they can carry the fire. And I believe that wilderness advocates and botanists and, and people like that, they are on that they're carrying the fire. Mm -hmm. Native Americans who who have the older eye, the inhabitants' eye on on the, the land, and I've met them, they're they're real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're carrying the fire. And at some point this thing begins to go down, the human expansion. And we're gonna need the people who remembered how to do the regenerative agriculture <laughs> and hunt the elk and be immersed in landscape and probably know it maybe make gunpowder or build a beautiful bow. You know, mm -hmm. we're gonna need those. And so I, I I think that the conflict is worth embracing and attempting to to navigate this time because it's not gonna last forever. Do you navigate through the edifices of the state? Is this public policy? Because you mentioned Wilderness Act, you know, creation of national. We parks. don't have it there. So I, you might have, if you listen to my nice stuff and you look at my library and stuff, I came from this as an anarchist. Hmm. 
as a, as a child, I was an anarchist. As a teenager, I was an anarchist. I was an anarchist in, into my 20s, where I believed that the, the power of the state was that of a tyrant and usurper. Mm -hmm. But then I started, like, really climbing in the Bitterroots and learning the history of the Bitterroot Mountains in, in Montana and going down to the Humbug Spires, which is all Bureau of Land Management land, climbing. And I'm like, I'm hunting, I'm climbing, skiing in the winters, and then my kids are born, and we're all out on the Lewis and Clark National Forest. Those things don't exist without the mechanism of governance. But I don't think that anarchism suggests no governance. Uh, and Idealistic anarchism does. Oh, yeah. The, the thing which has struck me coming from the UK to here is yeah. that I spend my life with these guys who their whole existence is hunting on public land. They're, you know, they couldn't... There's no access to private land, you yep. know, all these various things. And, you know, they rail against the government and socialism, and, you know, their feeling of over-governance, and I totally get that. Uh, there's not, I feel truly free when I'm on public land, and nothing has struck me so much as uh, an institution of democracy. And to me, a sort of, it's, the federal part is obviously non-anarchistic, -ar but uh, it is a, it is the most socialistic or anarchistic element of the country that I have experienced. And it's the world. both. Yeah, it's both. And and there's a there's a book um called The Narrow Corridor, and Darren Asa Muglu is one of the writers, and it's state societies and the fate of liberty. Mm -hmm. And the narrow corridor is a government that will exist by and for the people within the narrow corridor. Okay, mm -hmm. and what it does is it places like the sideboards on like out of control profiteering schemes. Um, it, it 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 and the narrow it falls out of the narrow corridor into kleptocracy or despotism, mm -hmm. most often. And these guys, um, God, I'm, I'm going to find this copy of this book before we leave. But um, they spent a lifetime studying failed states, mm -hmm. and. One of the things that they concluded was that the United States has occupied, the United States method of governance has occupied the narrow corridor of efficiency and, and it actually works a lot of the time. And we're all the time. I mean, we could sit around forever and point out the failures. Mm. But when you look at the public lands, they were, they were totally created by choice against huge opposition to keep this in a narrow corridor where they work for most of the people. Mm -hmm. And then the people who I know, they like, they'll, they'll be living, quite a few of them are poor, and they hate the government, and they hate the Forest Service, and they hate the BLM. And I'm going like, what would you rather have? Mm -hmm. And they don't have an answer to that. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm like going, you know, what exactly is your plan? And they don't have one. And if it were left to these, these folks who are so angry all the time at government, and they've been taught to be angry at government by those, if you look at like the Koch Brothers Network or uh, Jane Meyer's book, Dark Money, mm -hmm. they have been systematically taught, all of us have, and I bought into some of it myself, that the government is the problem, like Ronald Reagan said. Well, government is the problem in some ways. Government's definitely the problem if you want to dump your chicken grease into the Mulberry Fork of the river in Alabama because there's a rule in government that says you can't do that mm -hmm. because the people downstream are going to choke on it. So the government is definitely the problem if you are the Tyson company that wants to get rid of a billion gallons of chicken grease. And we've been taught instead that the government is, is tyrannizing us. Mm -hmm. But I used to ask like the Bundy people a lot. I would say, where is the tyranny? Like, like, do you know what tyranny looks like? Do you know what, you know, real concentration camps look like? Real jails? But they do know something real, and that was striking Tell to me. Because they're willing to, they were, it seems like, willing to die for something. And that's real enough. There's some sort of real impulse they're responding to. Uh, you know, what is it? I, I, it's, it's, I don't know. That's, that's, that's uh, your... You're supposed to be the answer man. Uh, what, why? Uh, over all the time I've interviewed the, the anti-government people, they pick out the failures of governance. And um, you weren't here in the 90s, like you're young, but there was Ruby Ridge and Waco. Yeah. Um, the FBI did some terrible things uh, during J. Edgar Hoover to conservationists like Bernard DeVoto, 
who was like, the, yeah, like yeah, one yeah. of the greatest defenders of the public lands. Um, I mean, we, if you want to look for government malfeasance it, or waste, it's not hard to find. But to concentrate on that and to ignore the honest successes of this model is to, it, it's to court disaster, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, you have to acknowledge that there would be no public lands without a federal government. So where are we in the narrow corridor? Are we in the corridor right now? Well, that Osamuglu also we we are we're we're sort of in the corridor. What they talk about is the Red Queen effect, where you have to run the population, the American people in this case we're talking about, have to run as fast as they can to stay in the same place, mm -hmm. because uh, the natural the natural state of of giving up people power over others is that they abuse that power. And the natural state of that, then that's the essence of anarchism, right? Don't give them the power in the first place. And I think something that the occupiers at Mount here would have said, in a, in a certain way. Yeah, absolutely. But but I asked them, they are not paying their grazing fees. Hmm. But I asked them, who would own the Mojave Desert? Yeah. yeah. If it, it wasn't that the federal government had taken it had had kept those lands after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in eighteen forty six. Um, if they hadn't, if the federal government had not safeguarded those lands in some some extent, Mr. Bundy wouldn't be on them. He he has 160 acres deeded on the Virgin River. He he doesn't have an army. I mean, even Preston Nutter was one of the major cattlemen of the uh, late 19th century, and he ran cows all over like the Arizona Strip, like like all over Southern Utah. He he was not Latter Day Saints, but he was a a huge entrepreneur. And even he said, without an army, I can't run cows. We have to have a solution. And the solution ended up being the Taylor Grayson Act of 1934, which went on to turn the General Land Office into the Bureau of Land Management. Hmm. And, and that was because people just killed each other over the grass. Yeah. And, and it wasn't like Mr. Bundy or Mr. Kyle or me that was going to run cows out there. It was whoever had the, the biggest clout. And a bunch of your people came over here from feudal Who's England. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> My people. Well, like from feudal England. Yeah. And they reestablished a, a form of feudalism in Wyoming, which led to the Johnson County War of 1892. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they, they killed people who ch attempted to file on their, their water. Mm -hmm. And if they could control the water, they didn't have to pay taxes on the on the grasslands. They could just run the cows on it. And then they had like serfs that came that they were like cowboys, but they considered them serfs. They were recreating jolly old England in the Enclosures Act, mm -hmm. which drove so many people over here. They were recreating it. And if you read the narrow corridor, one of the first places that government falls off out of the corridor into is feudalism. Mm -hmm. And if you read the corner crossing thing down in Wyoming where that guy's got 61 square miles and he's ready to sue these guys $7 million a piece for bruising his airspace to get to public land, mm -hmm. you see the new feudalism. Mm -hmm. And so the corridor is shifted now. But, but we have been through this before. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm saying with with the over recreation on the lands. We we saw not recreation before. We saw whole scale destruction. There seems to be something new about it, which is that it's a cold and savage feudalism. If you you know in European feudalism, it's deeply rooted in place because of technology at right. the time, right? Yeah, and and it's sort of contractual. Uh, it's not democratic, but there is some sort of give and take. Right. Whereas when the Wilkes brothers buy up you know how many acres in Montana and, and Idaho, uh, they 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 have they're not even anchored in place, and so they don't. There doesn't seem to be any sort of reciprocal responsibility, how, however unequal that would be. That's true. Now, that's true. But uh, let's, if you went back to Genghis Khan, when the horde came in, hmm. they didn't care about your sense of place or what you called the river either. Yeah. You know, they stacked them up. The people who, who caused trouble, they stacked them up, and then they renamed the town square, you know, Genghis, Genghis Happy Place. Yeah. But if we're, <laughs> if we're in China and Genghis Khan is... At the doorstep, we know what to do. It's very clear, and I think that yeah. uh, we're not in that sort of uh, the, the clarity of conflict is not there. Although maybe it's emerging. I think it's emerging, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things you'll see is um, 
this is the anarchism versus state power versus governance um, is uh, you you find people this is actually happening with natural gas right now and the export of natural gas we were talking about um, you find people who use the power of the state to then pervert the the game in their their way right it's the most natural thing in the world it's old as, as the hills but they use that they're the when the Wilkes brothers buy that and I and I, I can't ever say who, who told me this but I was a person who was involved in, in governance. And they said, you know, we believe in private property rights to the max. It's, it's sacred, private property rights. It, it is. And, and the deed, which is guaranteed by government, by the way, it's, mm -hmm. it's a piece of paper that we agree that the, the government will enforce. But private property is a sacred value here in the United States. But the questions emerge when someone owns three quarters of your county. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and who has the right to use this road or that road, right? It almost feels like a, a new Gilded Age, and there's a it is a new Gilded Age pendulum and push and pull. You it think is. it is? It is, and yeah, I, I definitely do. Now, one Gilded Age is not like another. No, but the the closest example that we can have in American history so far is the nineteen eighteen ninety two three Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened there was uh, economic collapse because the railroad speculating, and then it was the rise of Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. uh, by chance, to some extent, the rise of Te Teddy Roosevelt. By chance, uh, th it seems like the system is built to prevent that from happening. I think that uh, it, a lot of these concerns are, I think, the same concerns that are turning people on at now here. And I think the question is for them and, and for us is. Is, is the country too big? Is the, if our nature is to try to wrest power and use it in malevolent ways, uh, is the system out of control? And for those people, they feel like it is, and they want to respond with a sort of localism. I think the paradox there was that they weren't actually rooted in, now here seemed completely arbitrary, and they didn't actually defer to the authority of the county. No, they didn't. They, in fact, they said they believed in the county county supremacy, mm. but when Dave Ward, the sheriff, asked him to stand down, they said, no, nah, we, don't, we, we don't believe in that anymore. Mm. Like, like they, they don't, man, they, they don't believe in, they, you, it's a mistake to try to parse the Bundy movement beliefs mm -hmm. <laughs> anything beyond that this is just what they want to do at this time, it serves them best. It's it's kind of sad because I went there looking as an as an old time anarchist. I went there looking for people who mm -hmm. would be of interest, and it turned out that their beliefs and stuff were really, they were they were either ridiculous like QAnon type stuff. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that. <laughs> that dog has got a face full of dust. But there was a lot of that kind of just absurd conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And then there was a lot of simply self-serving stuff, and and also megalomania to the mm -hmm. max, like where Ammon was giving people like stock tips, and I mean mm -hmm. not tips on, on why regulating the stock market was wrong, and mm -hmm. he didn't know anything about the stock market and that dog go over there sneezing. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, although it seems contradictory, I you know we can look to it from a public lands perspective. And they've built an unusual coalition, and you, I, what I want to find there may not be there, right. but it's like, uh, who are the stakeholders? And the, and to some extent, um, it's a strange, bizarre thing because theirs is you know different politically, but the the ranchers are you know parallel stakeholders to hunters, and that's the coalition that you hope to build to push back against. You know whether it's government or corporate overreach. Uh, they seem right. to see one side of the picture, which is government overreach versus the other. But um, government overreach and, and this idea of out of control—that's always going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. Like like government is always going to overreach, and then people are going to have to the the people who comprise the government in the United States are going to have to push back. Mm -hmm. And then there there so you're never going to have a time. Thank the Lord. Where the United States of America is all peaceful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I associate like peace and harmony and stuff with with like um, Pyongyang, where if you get out of hand, you know these mm -hmm. guys come and they sweep you away at night and then you're dead. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to have that. Now, when you ask, is the country too large? Is it too big? Too diverse? Too too um, like like Andrew Sullivan writes about like 
democracies fail when they become that they abandon all concept of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And that's possible. All concept of hierarchy, like I'm better than you, and I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay. Um, uh, like the way we had, like, like uh, in the 1950s, where most most uh, African Americans, most Hispanics, most women were not in the job market. Yeah. You know, and, and the and the white guys, even if you're pretty mediocre, you had a pretty good job. And you're like, well, I can tell you what's going to happen. You mm -hmm. know, I'm Ward Cleaver. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that we did. We have we have left that. And there are dangers to leaving that. There are also incredibly good reasons to leave it. Mm -hmm. So we, we move ourselves forward into this future of unknowns. And that's good. Mm -hmm. the, the, like you ask, is the Gilded Age now? Gilded Age, is a, is a, this is the best representation of a new Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look like the one in 1893. Because mm -hmm. that one had a population of about 70 million people. Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly hierarchical. Mm -hmm. So this Gilded Age has a totally different feel. Right. Some of the similarities are there. You know, they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Mm -hmm. the, the, it seems like contradictory forces can, you know, push and pull each other in a useful vortex. And there's a locus of things. As long as they uh, are getting it, there, there's some common goal. I think the difference between ruling by consensus and ruling by compromise, right? Like, we're in a small tribe, we can rule by consensus because we're all pulling or pushing towards the same thing. We have to rule by compromise because you're a rancher and I'm a miner and That's we right. want different things. It, it seems like when those forces get out of control, the whirlpool comes apart or the tornado dissolves. It does. And, and it, that, that's a real possibility. It happens all the time to people. Yeah. Look at Venezuela. Yeah. Oh. I mean, look at Venezuela. A very, very it's a, it was a good country, <laughs> and, it, and the whirlpool came out of control. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, um, I mean, you look at Russia, right? I mean, who, who has Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Akhmatova, and the greatest writers of our, you know, of of, of literature, mm -hmm. the greatest thinkers, of, of some, and and that country totally spun out of absolute control. Mm -hmm. Anthony Bourdain told me one time that on the very brief time I met him was um, that he said, I, "I don't really go there now." One, because I don't want to drink that much vodka, which is part of the socializing. Yeah, yeah. He said, but the other is, it's like, it is one of the most inscrutable countries, how it produces the greatest thinkers, and then these just absolute disasters all around, right? Yeah. And I think that's a cautionary tale for us and, and as Americans. Mm -hmm. But um, before we leave that, it's, it's um, it, the, the consensus idea is only up to about 165 people. If you ever look at the Gore-Tex model or read Malcolm mm -hmm. Gladwell's The Tipping Point, mm -hmm. after that you have to have like elected bosses and and people have to people have to decide that we're going to listen to Joe or Jill or whatever you know, and we can't listen. We're we're no longer all a single tribe after 165 people. It seems like a hundred a, a, a human thing, mm -hmm. and so we're at 339 million here, so. I believe that the future here, <clears throat> I was in Utah, for instance, since the state land board has been selling off so many state lands, mm -hmm. the hardcore Utah people, anti-government type, they've decided, a lot of them, that they want the feds to keep the lands. Mm -hmm. they, they're changing mm -hmm. because the state has been selling off so much, much of their grazing, but they want the feds to not do anything that they don't want them to do. Mm -hmm. And so that, they're going to be disappointed. So is there an element of local? It, it, it may be. Let's go with that localism idea. From yeah, you know. maybe public lands. Uh, it's it seems like with so many local stakeholders. You know, back in the day they said Yellowstone. There's you know a couple thousand people living on the fringes of Yellowstone. Right. Uh, are there so many stakeholders that more power has to be that we can retain a system of public lands, but power should be divested to more of a local level? Your local BLM office. And you get into tough questions of funding at that point, but your local BLM office is more responsive to the needs of the community if it's sort of uh, more autonomous from the federal government. Right. So th there's the problem with that first you talk about is funding. Mm. Because if these lands made a lot of money, they wouldn't have been in public hands now. Mm. Right. Like if you could graze as many cows on the on eastern Montana BLM lands as you graze in Coleman County, Alabama, those lands would be private. 
Hmm. They would have been claimed a long time ago. They would have been given away on the Homestead Act, and they would now be in private hands. Just like any of the river bottom land is not public, it's private. Mm -hmm. right? So that you, you cannot fund these things locally. And the other thing is, is local control was sold as a, as a great idea for a long time by so-called conservatives or right-wingers, right? right? As long as the locals wanted to have all the trees cut down mm -hmm. or the big mine go in. But as soon as the locals in Colorado began to make ordinances about fracking within their city limits and stuff, the Colorado legislature voted to t take local control away from them. Right, right. And so the euphemism of local control has been more exploitation, more pillage. Right. Now, if you had locals who wanted the right kind of stewardship, you would still have somebody who at Rio Tinto who came in and said, I'm going to give you a swimming pool. I'm going to give you a new school bus system, a brand new ambulance. You're all going to get a chicken in every pot for the rest of your lives. And that, that mine would go in even if it was at the headwaters of the Smith River. Yeah, I mean, it's happening in San and Idaho. Yes. But, again, uh, but something that... I, and there, I, is that a bad thing that we would, would abandon conservation? Well, because the locals can't... The locals get rewarded now. I mean, Devoto said that the, the move on, on, on the public lands will always be for the devolution of control from federal to state. Mm -hmm. and from state to local, whose entities can be coerced in a way that the federal government allegedly cannot be. I'm going to add allegedly. But, but a, and a very real coercion in that you need, you know, it's, it's money to live, right? Yeah. Uh, something that struck me in the Malheur occupation is that there were some people on, on the local side getting on board with it because they felt their voices had not been heard, and there was a sort of uh, economic depression. It's not as bad out here as I've got family in upstate New York, and well, I don't, I don't want to make a comparison, but you know, yep. Uh, and to be heard and to be cared for, I think, and and to have some power that there were people who were being forgotten, and if Without they're forgotten, they're going to sell what they have, and they're going to be angry. Yeah. So the the answer is yes. The answer is, um, but you know what? At the mall here. They had been working for years on that coalition of grazers and water users and all that stuff that the Bundys didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. And um, they, anger, the anger, if you're angry about something that's really happening, I'm good with it. If you're angry about the pizza parlor with the pedophiles in some town in New York that you've never heard of, then that's misplaced. Mm. And so much of what we like you know what I mean the Pizza Gate thing that would turn out to be a conspiracy theory. I have no idea, exist. but yeah. <laughs> well, there's all these things that don't exist that we use to generate anger and votes and all this stuff in this age of information and misinformation. Yeah. If you are acting on, I had these ranchers in Nevada, and they were telling me they had a, they had a drought, and the BLM had made a blanket closure of some rangelands in order to protect the land. And they reduced the animal unit months. Mm -hmm. But the truth, the truth, I'm using air quotes, the truth was, is in these certain localized areas, that drought had not been particularly impactful. And these guys all knew it. So the problem with the BLM edict mandate, overreaching federal mandate, was that it was dispossessing them of the chance to make a, de a fairly decent year with these cows. And it didn't have a, a positive effect on the manager of the land. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who was right or wrong in this. However, they said if we had more BLM employees that we could talk with in this office and we had, they had, were totally funded so that they could bring these range riders out and we could show them what we're talking about, we believe that BLM management could be more positive all around. Mm -hmm. So what we've done in the United States is to deprioritize the funding for our public land management agencies and we deprioritize the health of these lands and at a time when we should have been putting that way up high as an issue of national security and, and resilience. When you've got a lot to be made from the privatization of public lands, is it a coincidence that public agencies are defunded? Defund and decries yeah. has been the method of, of privatization for the since Reagan. Mm -hmm. is, do you think that there are... Uh, Conscious strategies at play, or is this sort of the working out of? There are conscious. There, there are both. 
Mm -hmm. It's both. So one of the things that happened in the 1990s that I'm writing about right now in my book is the environmentalists were were horrified, like at the spotted owl thing, right? Mm -hmm. And the timber companies were cutting 5.2 billion board feet of, of lumber on the national forest because that was the last of the old growth in, in the, on the coast range and in, in, yeah. on the Pacific coast. I worked with that, yeah. So the debate became about the spotted owl because that was the way that the environmentalists could actually bring a halt to this overcutting. And then everybody was like, spotted owl against jobs. But it was really about the sustainability of that level of cut. And you mm. couldn't cut that much. Mm. So dig this, though. So we're at this place where those lands, the, the, the sustainable use of those lands for the mill workers and everybody else was not prioritized. The immediate profits were prioritized. That's a failure of governance. Mm. And, and during the 90s, though, the environmentalists started hating the Forest Service. The loggers started hating the Forest Service. Everybody started hating the Forest Service. And one of the things that Congress recognized was my voters are not motivated by voting for the health of the Forest Service. Mm. And so they didn't. And so there was a defunding of, of the U.S. Forest Service then, by various means, and the Bureau of Land Management, because people were not, you and me, were not at that time, were not voting with the public lands management and funding as a priority. We weren't saying, man, we gotta get those trails open, we gotta get employment out here, we gotta get better foresters, they're going to cost more money to, to tell us how to deal with this, to keep this mill open mm -hmm. while protecting the habitat for the black-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. We weren't doing that. And so our representatives weren't prioritizing that. Mm -hmm. So you can prioritize that. Mm -hmm. I, I worked in a town called Oak Ridge in Oregon, and it had it, it's just east of Eugene. And there it was, you know, three mills, whole industry, economic boom, and completely shut after uh, the Spotted Owl deal. Yeah. Even the McDonald's had closed down. Yeah. It was just, things were so, not going well. So I, here's a, here's what I wish people knew about that. And, and I don't know as much about it as somebody from Oak Ridge. But I also know something on a 10,000 foot level that they may not. Mm -hmm. um, almost half of that timber at the time went to Japan to be cut by mills that were more advanced than ours. They got 20% more out of a log. Mm -hmm. And we exported the timber that to Japan raw, mm -hmm. which is the, the hallmark of a colonial economy, is you send raw materials yeah. out and then they develop it and sell you back the IKEA furniture. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, those mill closures had as much to do with the unsustainable nature of the, of the cut and the export of our logs, which I am absolutely against. Mm -hmm. I'm on, I, am an, I am the original America first person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, people were losing those jobs based on an unsustainable model and a failure of governance to control those exports. Mm -hmm. And to speak for the people of Oak Ridge, the government was not speaking to them, but the problem is, is that, that the propaganda that was delivered to people who were losing those jobs and were angry, like you're talking about, they're mm -hmm. pushing the button. Mm -hmm. They're, damn it. Mm -hmm. They're pushing that button. Well, they were told that it was the spotted owl that was killing them. Right. It was told that it was the Endangered Species Act. It was the feds. Yeah, or the environment. And, or and the, the environment. And the pendulum seems, the sort of depressing thing about our moment is that it seems like the pendulum slings from one radical perspective to another and loses all nuance in the middle. It does. And that, or, that seems to be related to the new state of information and what you're talking about is sort of propaganda or branding and getting information your, your information which we all feel is the right information out to people we all feel our own information yeah, is the that's right, right information right. Uh, it, uh, have we, are we living in a time devoid of nuance or has this been consistent in your life and throughout the history that you've read we're living in a, in a time where nuance is less, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not devoid, but it's far less. And I, and I always think about this on, what do you want? I think about this on a, uh, like running a family. Mm -hmm. There's lots of nuances every day, you know. But as far as like running a, a country, the nuances are kind of lost. Mm -hmm. um, but we, it doesn't matter. Because in the, in, 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 at the end of the day, it is what it is. Um, in the end, the world runs of nuance. Mm -hmm. and, and 
reality is nuanced, mm -hmm. and so you're gonna have you're, you're you either win or lose, fail or succeed, based on your reaction to the reality of it, mm -hmm. not the propaganda. Mm -hmm. And and I do think about during the Civil War, if you go back and you read um one of my favorite things to do is go in the archives and you read this this newspaper called the Squatter Sovereign. Mm -hmm. It was from Atchison, Kansas, and it was a pro-slavery paper. And they, I mean, it, it's the most bizarre, like, propaganda jokes. Um, it, it, it would, you could see it, it's today. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Lawrence, Kansas, and I can't remember what, the Liberator, I think. You know, and, and the, then the Confederates sacked Lawrence. The, the border, the border ruffians sacked Lawrence. They killed everybody and burned it down, right? Mm -hmm. But they had a paper called, like, the Liberator, and it was all, like, anti-slavery, abolitionist paper. And the only information in there was, like, you know, anti-South. Mm -hmm. And so we've been here before. It's not like today, but it's not unheard of. Mm -hmm. And and there was no nuance leading up to the firing on Fort Sumter in 1861. Yeah, at a certain but, point, people lose their tolerance for nuance and, and they know, take they, decisive they like action. The, and they like the cannon. Yeah. And one of the things that happens is there were lots of nuance in 1865 when people came home with their arms shot off and their teeth blown out and tried to get the plantation, tried to get the garden going because the plantation was gone, mm -hmm. you know, and Atlanta was burned to the ground. There was lots of room for nuance after that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So we, we want to try to kind of hold off, right? So your next book is about past, present, and future public lands. Uh, how are we doing in relation, you know, you've now studied you study the history of these things. What uh, what does your historical perspective give you? Or is the prognosis bleak, or is it bright? It is as we choose, mm -hmm. over and over. People have to make a choice. Human beings have to make choices. Choices is all. We were talking about Jordan Peterson earlier. Yeah. It's really close to that. Like, like like you get up in the morning and you make a choice about how you want that day to be. If you don't make a choice, you're not going to get anything done. Um, we have a t it, it, it's a dangerous moment for public lands, but it always has been since 1891 when they first wrote the Forest Reserve Act. Um, it is not more dangerous than it was in 1953 when Senator McCarran of Nevada confide, con revealed a plot in Salt Lake City to take over 230 million acres of public lands and transfer them to the state to sell them off to his friends. Not more dangerous than that. But the idea that we can hold on to 640 million acres of public lands while arguing over things that don't have anything to do with that and not paying attention to that, now that's, that's not going to work. Is it a hopeful moment? It is as we choose. Mm -hmm. When you wake up in the morning, are you hopeful about the day or do you just say, let's just, I've got to put these jeans on, put on these boots and get to work? Mm -hmm. And perhaps at the end of the day, I can I'll have five more dollars than I had, mm -hmm. and I, I I'm gonna work. Mm -hmm. it, it is as we choose, mm -hmm. and that's that's really important because I'll tell you it's damned unlikely to have this public lands in the first place. Yeah, I and know. The, and <laughs> the Forest Reserve Act of 1891 had a thing called Section 24 in it that was a rider that allowed President Harrison to set aside the first, I think it was 13 million acres of like completely abused lands in the West at the head of the watersheds. Mm -hmm. And that's the basis of the National Forest System. And that was about as unlikely as anything could have ever. They had a few people in Congress that noticed Section 24, mm -hmm. and one guy said, not one cent for scenery! Mm -hmm. from, from Missouri or Alabama, I can't remember which. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you said earlier that you wouldn't be surprised if in the future, these places have Chinese names on them. And I used to live in New York, and something you notice in New York is the insane amount of absentee landlord yeah. and real estate owned by Chinese, Saudi Arabian, Russian. Right. Mm -hmm. Do uh, it, it saying something like that suggests that you think that these public, you know, the prognosis is bleak and that they will be sold off. I don't think so. I, I think the prognosis is um, in the up in it's it's in our hands um, now. I mean, I mean, long term, like really long term, 
I think that you're going to see either people will either really battle, probably not like physical com combat, but battle in po politically mm -hmm. to retain public lands. They will have to want to do that. Mm -hmm. Because um, the, what, what the Wilkes Brothers purchase in Montana showed me was that there was a demand for some of the least productive land in the whole state. The reason that they bought those ranches fairly cheaply was it's like you couldn't make a living on them. So let, let's, let me go to a nuance here. When the Bundys, and particularly Clive and Bundy, the, the patriarch, um, that guy, he's, he's a very likable person. Mm -hmm. he, he's an interesting man up to a point. He's, he's super tough. Like, like if you had a big job to do, like that guy was, would, would be right there, man. It'd be awesome. So these are fine. I, I think they're pretty, pretty damn good people. And um, one of the things that they miss, the nuance, is that cattle prices in the United States have been controlled by Cargill, JBS, and whatever the, the big four is. And the people that these guys vote for when they go are, are have worked to reinforce the stranglehold of this cattle producer uh, packing industry monopoly. Mm -hmm. which has kept the price of cows down, which has made the Bundys poorer every year mm -hmm. and has facilitated the collapse of these small ranches that the Wilkes brothers could buy for a song. You see what I'm saying? Are they... Uh, the so their anger is entirely misplaced. Were they more nuanced uh, when they were rooted in place when they had the standoff? Was it in southern Nevada? Bunkerville. Did, yeah. It seems like... The sentiment from that the public could get behind more. You know, you had some strange people going to Malheur, but it, there seemed to be a more cohesive ideology to what was going on in Bunkerville. It, or is that just am I am I reading that wrong? That um, my theory is that when you're rooted in place, you better understand things, and so you can retain nuance. But maybe that's not the case. Uh, I don't think that's too far off. Um, Bunkerville is the Bundy's town, and. Um, the gathering of those cattle on that land by the Bureau of Land Management, like, like, in my opinion, like that land, it, it can't support those cows. It's it, it's just a it's the Mojave Desert. Yeah. And it's Gold Butte National Monument, which is incredibly cool. But Bundy's cows are kind of all over the place, and then they're feral. They're declared feral or estray cows all the way down to Lake Mead. So there's all these weird cows like living out there barely and dying and stuff. But so that the gather by the Bureau of Land Management was it was under the law, it was legal. But they didn't have the power the, the, to enforce it when push came to shove. Mm -hmm. And they had to release the cows. And they, you're, you're, you are correct in that that was Bunkerville, that was his place. Mm -hmm. And people around there said, well that was too much, they shouldn't have taken his cows. Okay. They should have continued to negotiate with a guy who refuses to negotiate. Mm -hmm. But they, they did they, they did something that they couldn't have, the, the government did something that they couldn't really enforce. It's strange because both Bunkerville and Malheur seem not to be, be emblematic of any sort of deeper ideal, uh, but they've been blown up to represent these large things. And I, it seems like as you've interrogated them, it, it may, uh, their foundation may not really uh, share these ideals. It seems like it's mostly self-interested as opposed to expressing you, you know, being the, the tip of the sword for public lands and, the, and rangeland or, you, you know, mining rights and logging right. and the Forest Service, you know. I, I wonder, I, 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 would, I would pursue this further, um, but I wonder if they understand that what they're arguing for is corporate feudalism that has no place for them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a jump that they would just go like, I don't know what that is, I don't care. So are they real idealists? Because my, my feeling is that real idealists don't necessarily need to think about the implications of their ideals. Yes. And Clive and Mundy, I think, it, it has become that over time. Mm -hmm. He's kind of charismatic in his, his utter conviction, mm -hmm. you know, in, in his, that he's right. Um, it makes him charismatic. And I, but uh, they are they're not. They they are being used by those who would would further the cause of corporate feudalism. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's all it is. Like if you were to take away the restrictions on mining in in 
the United States, but there's not that many of them. The 1872 mining law is a disaster that should have been reformed in 1873. Mm -hmm. um, but they, those people wouldn't, they, they would get a job at a mine and then it would all be poisoned. And they would just be like, they, their, their little house in, mm -hmm. on the Virgin River would be worth nothing. Mm -hmm. What, what is the positive takeaway from this? How do we move forward? Is uh, How do you build a coalition of these people locally if there's such an information war going on? And it seems like the information war from the perspective of public lands is being lost. I don't know. I, I think it's being, I think it's been won, um, I think it's been lost on the macrocosm in America today. Mm. I think it's been won on the local. Mm. Um, it, people are, are I, you know what it is, okay, what we need a, a, a nuanced vision. We need a hybrid of the federal ownership of public lands and management and local input. We need more Native American tribal input into public lands management to, for, for positive reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, so what it, what it is is you can't just have the big fist, right? You have to kind of play the piano. And it's not as much fun mm -hmm. you, you, when you take the empty beer can and smash it on your head yeah. and you kill everybody. God damn it! You know, <laughs> yeah. it's not near as much fun. Uh -oh. But in the long run, you get to keep what you want. Mm -hmm. And with the beer can smashing and the yelling and, and the, the punching and hitting and all that stuff, you end up not getting to keep what you want. Mm -hmm. So maybe if everything is messy right now, it's an indication that things are in the right place. I agree. I, I, I totally believe that. <laughs> and... And again, when things are really messy, what you want to do is like get the vacuum out and, and clean and, and you, you don't just like burn the car mm -hmm. because the dog took a dump in the seat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You don't like set fire to your pickup so while the, you're on the road because the dog took a dump in the seat. On a really bad day, you might. I get the impulse to. You do, and you do, but, yeah. but what happens? Yeah. Now you're going to burn your shoe leather, your Kenetrex, yeah. you're going to be hitchhiking, yeah. your life is going to be quantifiably poor. Right, right. That's what I'm talking about. And you'll feel so good as it burns. You'll feel so good as it burns. <laughs> yeah. And uh, imagine the guys who fired the cannon into some Fort Sumter. Mm. They're going to watch this, mm. you know, hold my cider. <laughs> yeah. And then like and then, you know, five years later, it wasn't that much fun. Yeah. I mean I am I am down with the impulse to set fire to the pickup truck. Like like I've spent most of my life I feel like working against that. Yeah. You know, and a personal a personal path to work against that. It uh I mean, I came up in a place where, like, people, the people we admired the most, like, had, like, tattoos. I don't give a shit. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's connected to the creative impulse, and I think that as you try to channel them, you walk a fine line. Uh, that's right. Well, I mean, that's, and nowadays, that's, that's referred to as the accelerationist movement as well. You know that. Mm -hmm. So the accelerationist movement is is that with climate change, with overpopulation, with resource depletion, with um, the things people are, like. Let's just drive it and get it over with. Hmm. And um, okay, the watch and, it burn. Yeah, the watch it burn crew, and that that has an interesting left and right, you know, component. Yeah. Right. Um, environmentalists and like resource destroyers, mm -hmm. profiteers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's fascinating because uh, that one, the accelerationist impulse actually is a nihilistic impulse. Yeah. It's just, it's simply to, to, it's a self, it's set and fire to the pickup truck. It also enables you to live your life as an individual without guilt, without, right. you know, you can, you can be, it's sort of a hedonistic approach. Exactly. It's kind of like taking dope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, I ain't gonna pay attention to that. Burn it all down. Mm -hmm. You know, um. I just, uh, I look at, like, you're, when you're, you're talking about localism earlier, I believe, now I will, I, well, I, I change my mind a lot, but I believe right now very strongly that the future is hyper-local. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we'll get rid of the federal public lands at all, mm -hmm. but the future is hyper-local. It's, it's food security at the, at the local or county level. It's energy security through probably through you know renewables where you're not connected to the guy who could turn up your natural gas bill to $500 and you can't pay it mm -hmm. or like when the gas went up the other 
two months ago to five dollars. Like I hope that people thought about I'm being held hostage to um, to to these folks that control these levers. Mm -hmm. And what could I do to, to get away from that? That's why I, I, I became like a much more of a prepper mm. in the last like six months because I felt that, I, I feel the same thing everybody else feels. It's out of control. The pandemic broke the supply chains. And then like, like, like with these cattle producers, I'm just going to pay cash to a friend of mine for a steer. Mm. And I'm going to pay him more than he'll get at the market. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, but I had the luxury to do that. I live in a place where that's possible. To shoot an elk, you know, an elk. I, you know how much an elk meat is probably twenty five hundred bucks to shoot like a cow, which means you don't have to spend twenty five hundred bucks at the supermarket. Yeah. I don't ever want it to go that way. Mm -hmm. Like that's why we have the Lacey Act, mm -hmm. which you can't sell wild game. Mm -hmm. But the truth of it is, 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 is if you can be more self sufficient now on myself, it makes me feel better. I have a huge garden. Mm -hmm. You know. a, a massive portion of this sort of, I don't know if, if public lands is an environmentalist movement because I think it's, it's bigger than that, but a, a big part of the coalition who are fighting for these things uh, is really concerned about climate change. And something that alienates me, I assume it's going on because a lot of scientists say so, but you know, they can't even predict the, the weather next week, so I'm not going to take a look at the numbers. Uh, and it seems to be a big distraction. I understand why people in cities get on board with it because there's not that much that they can do on a personal level. You're so encompassed by systems that they have much less ability to separate themselves from systems in a sort of prepper way. Uh, but it seems to distract a huge amount of the conversation from local issues that we're able to deal with, you know, ecosystem resilience. And, uh, and kind of blow it up to this macro scale where my feeling is that on, in these broad, uh, at a very broad level, where it's very hard to understand problems, it's very hard to understand what even is going on. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, I'm right there with you on that. So, and, and I'm, I guess I'm persona non grata, like in the climate change world now, even though I, I've never been a science denier. Mm. I, I love science, and I enjoy climate science. Mm. Um, but... In my time here, man, I have watched people in the environmental movement abandon the most hands-on, actionable things in favor of talking to people who are glazed over about climate change. Mm -hmm. And I always go back to that scene in, um, I think it's called The Lord of War with Nicolas Cage. Oh, yeah. And they're in that, they're in Monrovia, Liberia during the height of the, what's called the Taylor Wars, right? And he's making a fortune. And those black prostitutes, those women are there with him. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, he said, I think you're really beautiful. I, I, but I, I think you, you probably have AIDS. And she goes, look out the window. She goes, we're all going to be dead tomorrow. She goes, you're worried about something that kills you in six months, two years? Mm -hmm. He goes, what are you, nuts? Mm -hmm. And I've looked at that as a climate change thing forever. Mm -hmm. I was like going, dude, they are they, they poured chicken grease in the mulberry fork of the Black Warrior River system in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Could we talk about, that's now. The fish are all dead. Like, people's properties are destroyed. Mm -hmm. Their property rights have been violated by this pollution. The river is it's one of the most beautiful rivers in Alabama. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I, I come from a species that's evolved from... To hundred thousand years of worrying about if we got enough mammoth meat for tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you're asking me to worry about something that's going to happen in 2080, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Doesn't work for me. There's other people. Again, I'm glad there's people that it works for. I think it's and they can watch out for us. If it gets you engaged in these things, then that's excellent. Uh, there's shame. I think is. Uh, fundamental human experience, you know, from Adam and Eve yeah. in the garden to the fall of man, yeah. you know, we're, we're still ashamed for Christ's uh, crucifixion, uh, and we take it every day, and it seems to, there's also, as you look through history, a constant sense of the impending apocalypse. Oh, and, and, and people, very, people and, are obsessed with it. And, and at every point, they believe it 100%, and so it's very hard to disentangle yourself from the present moment and go, is this, uh, you know, is this the constant impending apocalypse, or is this really here? Maybe... A bit of both. I don't or is Jim Jones going to you know get the calendar out next week and it didn't happen? Yeah. And he goes, oh, well, I, I got a new revelation. It happens yeah. next week. Yeah. And now we all got to like go into apocalypse mode again. I, what I think it's fascinating though, 
is that environmentalists who we would assume are these deep engagement people who love like praying mantises and botany and mm -hmm. stuff um, are as prone to apocalypse belief as like the most fundamentalist guy down in, in at, a, at a snake handling church. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a it's an impulse common to all of us, I guess. I personally don't have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm an outlier in that way. Mm -hmm. I just see things. I, I've got these buffalo skulls. I just mm -hmm. see things going on and on mm -hmm. and on and always changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think dispense with traditional religion at your own risk because you'll replace it with something. Uh, maybe, uh, Very fine, that's it, but, that's uh, true. but here we have it. Uh, like like that Kurt Vonnegut book, um, um, one where he has Bokononism. I don't know. He is, um, God, I can't read it. It's not slapstick. Um, anyway, he they they just invent their own religion because he says, well, you gotta have something, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's, they have Bokanonism, and uh, man has to man has to sit, bird gotta fly, man has to ask why why why, um, something has to bird gotta land, man gotta tell himself he understands, mm -hmm. and that was, like, <laughs> that was like the essence of the religion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh. But it, it, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not a believer. My my grandmother was a believer in the in the end times, mm -hmm. and when she was dying, she looked to be really old. Um, she was astounded that it hadn't happened within her ninety years. It's that's always astounded. been the case. I mean, true believers, the Jesus will return in our day. Right. Uh, at some, I don't know, real level. But you know, at the same time, if you listen to um, Amazing Grace. They say, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less hours to sing His praise than the moment we first begun. Mm -hmm. Which means that time means nothing in eternity. It means nothing in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. So these people, we are deluding ourselves. Mm -hmm. because, because the very essence of, of, of um, like God is beyond time. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's it's a it's a delusion. It's an aberration of human beings. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not going to end just because your three score and ten is up. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It might. <laughs> oh, but but I think the shame associated with it is what shame. impacts us in the real in the real world. And it's something that I see in people's relation to nature. Uh, and it, it it bothers me. You've made a life where you are very much engaging with nature as as part of it. And to view it as something which you know humans are only the Destroyers, yep. we're only the sulliers, with the ravenous. Like it, it, it bothers me as a, a sort of utopian vision of the past. And yep. It's as equally essentialist and without nuance as the other side of it. I, I totally agree. So here's here's the thing. So um, Bill McKibben's first book, big book, on um, the end of nature, which I absolutely do not like that book. Mm -hmm. I, f I find it to be so anthropocentric it is absurd. But I like Bill McKibben in other ways. Um, but he has a thing where you're on the 405 in L.A., you know, locked in traffic, and he said, it feels like sin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I'm a little bit too Nietzschean for that. Mm. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know that I can buy that. You know, beyond that's like a, that's like a, uh, that's kind of a human idea. Mm. But I would say that this idea of humans as being a destroyer, a Shiva, the destroyer, the destroying force, um, I think there's a, there's a, a, a litmus test you can give yourself. I think you can, you, can actually, you can actually see this. And you can say, is this piece of land that I'm on, is it more filled with life than it was when I showed up? Mm. Or what are, are my actions working towards a negative force or a positive force? And that's one reason I'm super addicted into this pollinator belts, and I'm like I'm I'm all in on this thing and restoration of habitat mm -hmm. around America, the restoration of creeks. You just get so much life affirming bang for your buck mm -hmm. for the most minimal type of planting freaking milkweeds. You can see this burgeoning of life, positive life energy. Whereas when you clear out for the new Saturn plant down in Alabama and you just have that red dirt that's packed, you have a negative force going on there. Now you may, you're trading one thing or another that you want, right? But it's very negative. Uh, how and, about your place? The, how is the abundance of life 
changed in your place over your time here and in Alabama? Because I think that could be a good diagnostic I, of how we're doing. I think we, we the, the human beings, population, and needs are drawing the energy. Mm. Oh, and so there is less available for other species and other other ecosystems that, that are filled with lives that we don't even understand. Like you're talking about soil health, you know. Mm -hmm. We don't have any idea how all this works. And I do think that we are commandeering a, an inordinate proportion of the energy now for our own needs. Mm -hmm. And that's a function of, of population. Mm -hmm. um, microcosmically, though, like in this yard right here, this garden produces an enormous amount of food, and we have all the pollinator stuff planted. Mm -hmm. And there's more stuff going on out here than it was when I moved here. Mm -hmm. On our place in Alabama um, that I inherited, um, we need some active management in order to maximize the amount of um, ecological process that's available there. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of Chernobyl effect that people, I think, uh, on the shame side of things, you know, harken back to us like, we, we are the impediment to nature. You step out and nature, you know, uh, Nausgaard says nature is uh, immensely abundant. And I think he means it just, uh, it's resilient and it does come back. But it, it seems to me there's an active role that we can play in, in, in aiding that. And we're not going to have a, thankfully, the world will not be a Chernobyl uh, with cancerous wolves. Right. Uh, what... I don't know where the question is there. Uh, well, the answer is 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 um, if we are cursed as people, so so um, shame can be a, a positive or a negative, right? You yeah. can be ashamed of stealing all the money from the, the bank right. or the church, mm -hmm. and then you can pay all that money back. It can it can cause you to say you've done something, you've wronged someone, mm -hmm. and you're ashamed of it. And then you go and try to make that right. Mm -hmm. So shame could be positive or negative. Right. Um, so I think that we should be ashamed of having like <laughs> it's it's nuanced, right? Because um, but we should be ashamed of what we did to the bison. Mm -hmm. We should be ashamed of what we did in the conquest of North America, like like the Marias massacre on the Blackfeet. Um, should and, we? Should you and I be ashamed of these things, or sort of no, no? You don't have to be. You don't have to be personally ashamed. Mm. You have to acknowledge that this was a shameful act, right? Right. Um, of which you are somewhat a beneficiary. We're sitting in this house that's in the heart of the Blackfeet right, Nation. Right. Right. Okay. So I'm definitely a beneficiary of of a um, a a war that included shameful acts. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little different than other people in that I don't necessarily see war as neither bad or good. It's simply something that people do. Mm -hmm. But that war did include shameful acts, which included the divestment of one group of people. The arrow, the, you know the word arrogation? Mm -hmm. it's, it's to take something, to lay claim to something to which you have no like declarable right. Mm -hmm. And so there was the arrogation of, of vast parts of people's territory. I think that's a uh, that's a recognition of shame. It's a recognition of a shameful act, but it's not necessarily like an uh, individual feeling of shame because what seems like I don't feel it. It would be a dislocated shame if you yourself as an individual, like if it impacted your movements about life in your head. I you think know? that would be a, uh, well. And, I think that'd be a negative use of the shame. And dislocated shame, I think, becomes distorted, and that's where that's where it begin, begins to go in the wrong direction. Yep. Shame, that's a good point, shame uh, is a very useful tool we have developed for good reason. It helps us be good people. Right. It can. It can. It can. It, uh, when right. we experience it, I think, as a person, you, you know, and things close to us. Right. And, um, and actionable mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. That's another thing. You're yeah. getting, um, but, but one of the things about that is, is as far as history goes and shame and history, uh, is we carry the baggage of history with us to, to wherever we're going. Hmm. And that's yeah, that's fine. You just you recognize the failures of the past, but to, but today is a new day. Mm -hmm. And so you you can't be bound by the failures of the past. In, in the same way we're talking about in the Gilded Age, it is not a new Gilded Age. Hmm. It is like the Gilded Age. Many things are similar. Mm -hmm. You know, like like but there is no place where you can go. Oh, that was perfect. Mm -hmm. Let's recreate that. That's got to right. be the biggest delusion that people could ever have. Right. So um, when I was thinking about the McKibben book and the shame and all and, and, and the sin of it, you can choose to act, though. And it's it, here's, a, here's a very positive thing. 
we can choose to act and do active restoration of ecosystems to build ecological resilience mm -hmm. and perhaps that will help us more of us prosper in the time of climate change that's coming whether we like it or not I, I think the science is clear on that mm -hmm. so why not do that given that it works on so many different levels in, in a positive way to address the alleged sins of the past where mm -hmm. we killed all the buffalo and we blew up uh, the little Rocky Mountains for gold that went to other global markets, you mm -hmm. know, and left a cyanide heap leach pit, mm -hmm. you know, like that was a that was a, a pretty bad thing. Yeah. Um, so let's don't do that again, and, and people, we'll be better off. And people talk about buffalo robes, but I think you you know it, it's clear when it's plumes for rich ladies' hats and buffalo yep. robes. Okay, this is a bad thing, and it's a clear bad. But the question the I think the question that climate change abuts against is development now, and what about electricity to keep that baby on a ventilator or whatever it yep. is in you know Somalia, uh, and and we've now there's a there's a fine play of that, and it's it seems uh, harder than buffalo pits, you know. It is. It's way harder, but it it's the issue of our time. So here's a here's a big problem I have. I don't have an answer to this, but what many of the solutions to climate change or, or the climate change things, that what they say is we're going to give you all of this renewable energy and all, so you don't have to change. <laughs> yeah. It blows my mind. It's like, you don't have to worry about how many people there are. You don't have to worry about ever like being cold. Mm -hmm. We're going to fix it for you right. if you do this. So and that the truth is, is the paradigm which gave, created our addiction to fossil fuels and the release of the, the powers of ancient sunlight into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm. The, so, the endless growth paradigm. Yeah. The idea that we're somehow separate from nature is the, is the problem. I think endless growth is greed. And, the, and, so, and laziness, too. Yeah. You don't want to get cold. You don't want to be hot. And so like, if we frame consumption in that way, wh what do you think about things like uh, I've just recently listened to your interview with Yvon Chouinard and this sort of privatized model of consumption in which we can protect you know, the, or restore the environment and be participants in it as we consume in you know, a, a fairly traditional sense of consumption. Is that, is that a path forward? Doesn't work. Okay. Doesn't work. The path forward is, is, is well, it would be what we choose. We're going to navigate a difficult period of time as the human population gets to be whatever it ends up being. Mm -hmm. And my belief is that we can choose, like local food security and whatnot, with pollinator belts and all that, we can choose positive models as we go through. But we're going to be under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And the, the paradigm that this is not important, that we can do whatever we want, that's the one that's going to be questioned. Chenard questioned that early on. Mm -hmm. He just looked at it in the same way Ed Abbey did, but Chenard was more, was less of a literary person and more of an act mm -hmm. person, an act, a man of action. Mm -hmm. um, and he just said, regenerative agriculture, it's the future whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like spraying these wheat fields from here to Chester, Montana until mm -hmm. there's no life on them. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be part of the 22nd century. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's just obviously not going to work. Right. And so you might as well begin these experiments with Patagonia money to do regenerative agriculture and try to work in a change in government mm -hmm. to re-incentivize food security from local people and de-incentivize the mass accumulation of all this land out here for exported wheat, which is sprayed with a chemical, which means that they, there's no life on it mm -hmm. other than the wheat grass. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be a thing in, in another thousand years. So, so do you think that participating in the same, that we can create change by participating in the same systems that are 
creating the problem. You're going to participate in it whether you like it or not. Okay. Because you drove over here in a rig. Yeah. I'm driving a 97 Sierra. Mm -hmm. One of The only thing I don't choose to participate in because I don't have any money is a new car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? We are participants whether you like it or not. Okay. We are we are travelers in the human but we realm. Can, we, but we have to participate at a certain level, but you're not completely committed to that because you hunt for me and you're right. raised. You know, you're, there's some level of agency. And I raise my children as minimalist uh, as I could without without being a fanatic. Yeah, and, and so to what extent, you know, f for instance, uh, I not to harp on Patagonia, but it seems like a useful counterpoint, uh, and, and, you know, they've done a, a lot of stuff mirroring the Wilkes Brothers and these huge, pu uh, you know, private land things which are pitched as public, and we'll see. Uh, can you, you know, can someone accumulate billions within a system uh, uh, isn't there an exponential? Well, this is a terribly phrased question. Uh, Go ahead. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, Warren Buffett continually justifies his holding on to his billions for the most part by saying that he's the best. You know, this is sort of the ass underwritten assumption that he's the best person to manage the money because he'll do the best with it and then he'll put it back into the system. Right. Can, uh, can we? It, it seems like a sort of similar model to the. Uh, we're going to create uh, polyester clothing out of petroleum products, and like we're going to pay our workers a little bit better. Can the, it, are those? Is it a contradictory approach to solving a problem in the system that creates the problem? I don't think it's contradictory. I think that it is a a a seeking of a new current within an an uh, a prevailing paradigm. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that we talk about in conservation a lot is you, you need firebrands and renegades on all sides, right? In, including like the anti-government movement. Yeah. You need people questioning government. I, I, I'm 100% on that. But, so you, but then you need to have the narrow corridor. You need to have people who will act within the, what we call the parameter. Everybody calls it. I don't call it this. The parameters of the possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things about public land management is you say, well, what are the parameters of the possible here? And, and you'll have somebody who is like a um, very much a preservationist, and they just say, we just want as much old growth timber as possible. We want the forest to be unmolested by man, you know. And then somebody goes, well, but like down here in the Swan Valley, like these people need jobs, and I'm afraid that if you keep them out of the forest, they're not going to support the forest at all. And some, they will then actively work to have the parts like privatized. Anything's better than this, we can't use it. Mm -hmm. So you have to have people using it. Um, and, and you will fight with that balance, right? But you're working in the paradigm. Mm -hmm. You're still in the paradigm because the, you, can't, you can't really, like, revolutionary movements have not really been that successful mm -hmm. other than the American Revolution in 1776 for us. Hmm. I'm not sure that that was a revolution. I think a revolution implies like a radical upheaval of power. And right. it seems like that was a violent transition of power. You know, all of the people who were in power at the beginning of the revolution on the state side were in power at the end of the That's revolution. True. That's true. Right. One of the it things they did, civil war one could, of the revolutionary acts that was done, I, I agree with that, mm -hmm. but was to write the Constitution, which then limited right. the power of those who won. Yeah. I was like, damn, there's a paradigm shift. Uh, unbelievably prescient. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that was a paradigm shift. Yeah, um, mostly like um, like in Liberia during the Taylor Wars. You know, mm -hmm. Charles Taylor, he he won. He was a very interesting person. And he was he had charged with embezzlement. He got money in Massachusetts. He was working at a convenience store, mm -hmm. and he took that money and went back to Liberia. And he took over. He mm -hmm. won. I mean, he won. Mm -hmm. But he didn't like write a constitution limiting Charles Taylor's power. He caused incredible amounts of trouble, mm -hmm. and, and 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 ruled as a dictator. You know, mm -hmm. so like that one that was not a good idea. The 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 original revolution in Liberia in the eighties with Samuel Doe, um, this didn't really work to better the cause <laughs> of individual liberty and prosperity in Liberia. But I, the United States won. Because they wrote the Constitution, did represent a shift in a paradigm. Right. No. Totally. And and I, I think of Nicaragua too. You know, like there's whatever Daniel Ortega. Mm -hmm. He's still like, like running things incompetently mm -hmm. and you, you, since 1979. <laughs> yeah. But like, 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 if that's revolution, sign me out. Yeah. You know, I don't want it. I, and I think that part of why I come to you is because 
uh, historical, per in, in order to determine where we are, we need historical perspective in that uh, if the middle way seems to be the right way, uh, we need to figure out, are we, are we on the middle way? Do you feel like... That's right. And, and is, there, is there a place for a middle way in a paradigm which is destroying everything around you? Yeah. I yeah. mean, here's, here's what I think on this. Um, I think that we are not looking for revolution in any way in the, in the classical sense, hmm. in the same way you're talking about the U.S. revolution wasn't really that. Hmm. We're not looking for that. Hmm. What we're looking for is, and, we are ha and it's happening right this second, what we are looking for is the questioning of the current paradigm and the building of, say, a million small paradigms. Right. And I'm watching this with, with people of, they can be super far right wing too, mm. or they can be super far left wing, but they are, or they can be centrist, which I consider myself, mm -hmm. political centrist. Mm. Um, they are gardening. And they're planting the pollinator belts. Kyle Leibarger, who I did that podcast with in mm. Alabama, has 144,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. And all he does is go around and look at native plants and ask people, consult with landowners about expanding the biodiversity and, and, eco and ecosystems on their land. Mm -hmm. 144,000 people are on Instagram following him. And so that's a huge shift. Mm. The farmer's market things in America... That's a huge shift. The pandemic showed us that the, that, that the supply lines are fragile and that government has a limited amount of ability to do things for you that you really want to have done. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Yeah. Um, so we are going, it's, it's a paradigm shift that we're looking for. Hunting is a huge part of it because you cannot hunt in a destroyed landscape. Mm -hmm. they, the animals aren't going to be there. So unless you become a steward, you're not going to be doing that. So you, the impetus is upon you to be a conservationist and a steward and to learn as much as you can. That's a shift in the paradigm. The old paradigm was, go get your tasty meat down at the Winn-Dixie, dude. Mm -hmm. Why would you get out of the chair when you got TV and can, can work an extra shift and get the meat mm -hmm. at the Winn-Dixie? Why would people do that? Because they don't believe in that. They don't want that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the shooting it out of the corn feeder again. You people, the paradigm is shifting. Will it shift fast enough to save us? What would that even look like? Hmm. I mean, when I, when I look at the climate change people talk about saving the planet, what does that look like so that we can have 20 billion people? So that there'll be no, no life left in the oceans? Right? I mean, what are we talking about saving, right? I mean, I'm talking about shifting a paradigm so that when this population event comes to a decline, there's going to be a billion, two billion people around the world who know how to hunt and where the fish live and why that creek is so important and what those plants are like Kyle Leibarger's doing in Alabama. And they're going to be happy. They're going to be just as happy and just as unhappy as me and you are today. There's going to be like beautiful gals and dudes dancing, you know, in this faraway place that doesn't include a constantly expanding human population with a constantly expanding like portfolio of stuff I just gotta have. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I see it in my vision, and what we do to get there in our three score and ten is to like teach little kids about what plants there are, show them how to catch fish and why fish are in there in the first place. Talk about a, la a, a, a talk about a, a life that does your validity does not depend on what how big a truck you drive or what kind of shirt you got. What is real? Dirt, blood, weather. Once you get that, you're building a paradigm for the ages. Navigating to get there, it's gonna be rough. It's Hell, it was rough in the Civil War. It was rough when Genghis Khan was galloping into your town. It was rough if you were on one of the horses riding with the horde. <laughs> it's always been rough. That's the nature of humanity. And within it, there's these fantastic levels of joy. Mm. And I notice that those are mostly experienced in the natural world. Inside the thing we started talking about. Not separate.
I mean, I would love to start up a, a brand new F-250 to go get my firewood this weekend. But yeah, it, 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 that would dwindle. Mm. Whereas going and hanging out with my kids on the river, it doesn't dwindle. It's big. Mm. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I mean, I definitely have a vision. Mm. You know? Yeah. 